to God's word, then to Psalm 146. And when you found that, we'll pray together. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for who he is. Thank you that he's your son. Thank you that he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thank you that he's returning to usher in your eternal kingdom. And thank you, Father, that we know him as our husband, as our friend, as our saviour, as well as our King. And Father, we want to grow closer to Jesus tonight. So please, will you open your word to us by your spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this psalm gives us a wonderful invitation to praise the Lord. I wonder, have you ever been to a big Christian meeting? Maybe somewhere like Word Alive or Keswick or the Aberystwyth Conference. And you've praised God with thousands of others. It's an exhilarating experience. But actually, praising God is spiritual warfare. It's a battle. The psalmist here sets a very high standard. First one, praise the Lord. That's a command to all of us. And then he speaks to himself. Praise the Lord, my soul. Come on, self, he says. Praise the Lord. Then he says, verse 2, I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. I wonder, can you say that? Or what about Psalm 34, verse 1? I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Can you say that? Praising God is a wonderful experience. It lifts us out of ourselves. It focuses us on God and on all that he's done for us. It does us much good to sing these psalms of praise. But the truth is, God's praise is not always on my lips. And no matter how hard I try, it never will be this side of heaven. I'm selfish and sinful. I want to praise myself sometimes. Sometimes I'm too self-pitying to praise God. Sometimes I just can't concentrate on praising God. How can I sing Psalm 146 then? Well, fortunately, I don't plan to take you on a guilt trip. I don't plan just to make you feel guilty. We are unable to praise God consistently and perfectly. But come back with me to a synagogue in Nazareth where a young carpenter attended the meetings every, every Sabbath and sang the Psalms week by week. Here is Jesus being prepared for the mission for which he'd come. And Jesus could say, I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. God's praise was continually in his mouth. And the wonderful thing is that if you're a Christian, if you're in Christ, your praise is acceptable to God because you're praising God in Christ. Your prayers and praises are heard by the Father in the name of Jesus. When you come to praise God, you come dressed, so to speak, in the righteousness of Jesus. When God looks at us 
and hears our praises of him. He sees the perfection of Jesus. Because Jesus can praise God perfectly, so can you and so can I. If we're in Christ. If we're in Christ, what's true of Jesus is true of you. You can say to yourself, praise the Lord, my soul. Come on, soul, praise him. And even though we're sinful, I'm sinful. Even though we're selfish, even though we don't always feel like praising God, we can be counted as justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'm as perfect as Jesus. It's a bit like when God flooded the world in Noah's day. And to be saved, you had to be in the ark. The ark is a picture. Those who were in the ark were saved from God's wrath. Well, in the same way, you and I must be in Christ, in Jesus, included in his people. And therefore, God doesn't see our selfishness and lack of praise. God sees Jesus perfect worship of him and we're included in that hebrews 2 verse 12 quotes psalm 22 verse 22 and applies it to jesus it says this i will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly i will sing your praises calvin says this makes jesus the chief conductor of our hymns. True, Jesus himself is praised and glorified. But as our great high priest in heaven, Jesus is leading our worship in this service. Jesus is declaring God's name to us. That's part of a priest's role. And he's conducting us as we sing God's praises. And because we're in Christ, clothed in Christ, included in Christ, God accepts our praises gladly. God is pleased to hear us. He doesn't say, what, you? How can you come and praise me? After what you did this week, after what you failed to do this week, after the way you let me down, how dare you think you can come to church? He doesn't say that. He says rather, oh, it's you. How lovely you are. How perfect you are. How perfect are your praises because you bring them in Jesus name. Because God doesn't see me in my filth, in my sin. God sees us in Christ. He sees us as just as perfect as Christ. And that makes all the difference to our praises. So that's the context of this teaching. Praise the Lord. In Christ, God loves to hear our praises, and there's no condemnation for us, only welcome in his presence. This psalm shows us two ways to praise God. Firstly, praise God, not princes. And secondly, praise God because he cares. So firstly, then, praise God, not princes. This is verse three. And when it says, do not put your trust in princes, it doesn't just mean don't trust in the royal family. And today we're giving thanks for the life of Prince Philip. He was a very good prince. But when the psalmist says, do not put your trust in princes, it doesn't just mean that. It means don't put your trust 
in those who seem to have the power. Don't put your trust in mere human beings. See the second half of verse three, in human beings who cannot save. God does bless us wonderfully with human help. My wife is the greatest help to me. She helps me in the home. She helps me in my ministry. I'm so grateful for her. But I can't ultimately put my hope in Becca because verse three, she cannot save. There's only one person who can save and that's Jesus. I can't turn up at the judgment seat of Christ. And when he says to me, why should I let you into heaven? I can't say, well, my wife was a very good person. I was hoping to get in because I was married to her. That won't do. Human beings cannot save. We look to human beings all the time, don't we? If we're ill, we look to doctors. If we're unemployed, we look to, to employers to give us a job. If we're suffering from depression, or if we're addicted to certain substances or patterns of behavior, we look to experts who can help us. But ultimately, all people will let us down, verse four. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. All people ultimately let us down because all people die. God may give you a very good doctor who can make you better or a very good wife who can make you a better person or a very good therapist who can improve your health. But it is God who ultimately heals. It is God who will heal us when we go to heaven. And so do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. They will die. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Don't trust in princes or people who seem to have the power. Rather, verse 5, blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Perhaps you do feel hopeless. Perhaps you are depressed or addicted to drugs or just feeling defeated by life. God might well give you a human being who can help you. But the helper you really need is the God of Jacob, the God of the Bible, the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Our hope needs to be in him. When I drive my car, I put my trust in the mechanic who services it. I trust that he's done a good job. I trust that my car is roadworthy. But ultimately, it's God who will decide if I die in a car crash or die of cancer or just die of old age. My hope must be in him. My hope must be in God, not in my own strength or my wife or my friends or my work or in anything else. Blessed is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Verse six, he is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. God made you, God made me. God made the world, heaven, earth, the sea and everything in them. God made all that. God's power is of a different order of magnitude 
from human power. Perhaps there is someone who really intimidates you. Perhaps that person seems to have a lot of power over you. Well, God made them and they will stand before God on the day of judgment. When I was a student, I found my tutors intimidating. We had to go before a panel of tutors at the beginning of every term, at the end of every term. They seemed very powerful. They could decide whether I would pass or fail. But they didn't have the real power. God made them. They'll give an account to him at the judgment. What I should have done is imagine those tutors on their faces before Jesus on the day of judgment. Because that's where they'll one day be. And only those whose hope is in the Lord their God, only those who are in Christ, in the ark, so to speak, only those who are really Christians, who really know God as their father, who really know Jesus as their saviour and as their king. Only God's people can rejoice that he is the maker of heaven and earth. If you don't know God as your father, if you don't know Jesus, it's a terrible thought that God made you. God made you, God has given you everything, and then you've ignored him and disobeyed him. Jesus taught the reality of hell. There is a day of judgment and those whom God has made will give an account for why they've disobeyed him. And Jesus says in Luke 12 verses 4 and 5. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So when my tutors were intimidating me as a 19 year old, I should have remembered God alone is to be feared. But he remains faithful forever. If you know him, if you love him, you'll know his faithfulness in your life. You'll know that you can always talk to him. That you, will always, you can always trust him. That he'll never let you down. So praise God. Not princes. And secondly... Praise God because he cares, verse 7. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. Like many towns here in Baldock, we have a food bank. The food bank literally gives food to the hungry. But it's God who ultimately meets our needs. Are you oppressed? Is there someone who really gets you down? God upholds the cause of the oppressed. Have you prayed about it? Talk to your heavenly father about your situation. Maybe you've got to trust God literally to put food on the table. Well, God upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. Are you a prisoner? Maybe a prisoner of drink or fags or illegal drugs or pornography or anger or negative thoughts 
or even social media. It's the Lord who can set you free. It's the Lord that you need. Verse 8, the Lord gives sight to the blind. Maybe he won't heal your sight, this side of heaven. Maybe he will. I was told this year that I've got cataracts coming. And I'm only 47. It's a bit of a blow. But cataracts are easily treatable. Jesus was more interested in treating spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness matters far more than physical blindness. Can you see that you're a sinner, but that Jesus is a great savior? Can you see that God made the world and therefore we owe him everything? And therefore, we must give our lives to him. Can you see this? Ask God to open your eyes to see the truth. We used to sing a chorus when I was a boy. We sang it in school, in Welsh, actually. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Perhaps that needs to be your prayer doesn't matter if it's in Welsh or English or any other language. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. That's a picture of being crushed by the pressures of life. Imagine that like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, you've got a heavy weight on your back. Maybe that's how your sin feels to you. You can't carry the weight of your guilt. And Jesus comes along and he says, let me take the weight. Let me take your sin. Jesus did take our sin. Jesus was loaded up with the sin of God's people. And he took the punishment for that on himself, on the cross. You might be bowed down by the things you've done wrong. And Jesus says, I've dealt with all that. I've taken the punishment you deserve. I can set you free from your guilt. The Lord loves the righteous. God says, instead of fearing hell, you can know my love. You can be one of my righteous ones. You can be in the right with God. You can be just as righteous as Jesus. And you can know God's love. The Lord loves the righteous. Maybe you're an immigrant, verse 9. The Lord watches over the foreigner. Perhaps you know the story of Ruth in the Bible. Ruth was a foreigner. She came from the land of Moab. She had nothing. She was a widow. She had no money and no status in Israel. And yet God watched over her. He gave her the ideal husband in Boaz. He prospered her. And he made Ruth one of the ancestors of Jesus. So the next part of verse 9, God sustains the fatherless and the widow. Maybe you have no relationship with your human father. God will be your father. Just as he looked after Ruth, the Moabite. Maybe you're a widow. Put your trust in God. Praise the Lord because he cares. But he frustrates 
the ways of the wicked. You'll never escape God if you're trying to avoid him, if you're trying to ignore him and disobey him. God will frustrate you. He will frustrate your plans in this life. And he will frustrate your attempt to get into heaven after you die. Look what the gospel offers you. The love and care of the God who made you. Or alternatively, frustration. Verse 10, the Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. The Lord reigns. He is the king. I'm not the king. You're not the king. Who will you put on the throne of your life? King Jesus or self? The Lord reigns. Are you thrilled to be one of his people? I once took part in a service in London in which the Queen was represented and many politicians were present. It felt a great privilege to be part of it, to be a subject of Queen Elizabeth II. It is a privilege to be one of Her Majesty's subjects. And I'm sure our thoughts and prayers are with her tonight in her bereavement. It is a great privilege to be a subject of Her Majesty because we're a free people and that's not to be taken for granted. But Her Majesty the Queen will one day stand before Jesus at the judgment. Just like any other sinner. And I'm sure her hope for that day is Jesus Christ. Yes, verse 10, the Lord reigns forever for all generations. The Lord reigns even over the Queen, even over our politicians. And so we come back to where we started. The psalm begins, praise the Lord, and it ends, praise the Lord. Ultimately, all people are either rebels against God, or they know him as their king, and they praise him. Are you praising him tonight? Am I praising him? Are you one of his people? Do you love him? Are you serving him with the whole of your life? Is your whole life one of praise to him? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you accept our praises and our prayers when we bring them in Jesus' name. We thank you for him, Lord. We know, Father, that in our own strength and our own goodness, we have no right to come into your presence. We know how we fail to praise you day by day. We know how we praise ourselves. And Lord, we're sorry for that. But we thank you for Jesus. We pray that each one of us here tonight would be included in him, like Noah's family in the ark. Would we be in Christ and therefore safe from your wrath, from hell, saved for heaven, for a relationship with yourself, Lord, we commit ourselves to you and we pray that we will live for your praise and glory. We pray for the ministry of our churches, Father. 
We pray for Town Hill. We pray for a great outpouring of your spirit in that area. We pray that you be giving conviction of sin and faith in Christ to many people. Lord, we pray that for Swansea. We pray it for Baldock. Father, we pray that you would be merciful to us. We pray for our country tonight, Lord. We pray for our Queen and for the royal family. We pray that each one of them would trust you personally and submit to you as King. And therefore know your comfort tonight. So we thank you, Father, for the time we've had around your word. And we pray that you'll keep us feeding on Christ in your word and in prayer in this coming week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall I leave it to you, Jeff, to announce the next hymn?